Welcome everyone. This is the AO Trauma North America Hand Surgery Essentials course and tonight we are going to be talking about scaphoid fractures and non-union. Thank you everybody for participating. Our faculty tonight consists of David Dennison from Mayo Clinic, John Elfar in Hershey, Pennsylvania at Penn State. I'm Kyle Bikel at the Hand Center of San Francisco. Chaim Mudgal is our chairman of AO North America Hand Education Committee. He's at Harvard Medical School. And Gary Solomon is our therapy uh, participant, and he is the therapy director at Arlington Heights, Illinois. Before we get started with a few more slides, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Mudgal, who has a few comments. Chai? Thanks, Kyle. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I, I haven't done this before in terms of addressing everyone as the chairman of the AO North America Hand Education Committee. Most of the times I've just been one of the faculty, but today I'm doing this in my official capacity. Over the last several weeks, there have been occasions when uh, we have received feedback from you. I want you to understand that we really, really welcome feedback from you, but that feedback should be restricted to hand surgery and the topic that is being discussed. Unfortunately, some of you have taken it upon themselves to give feedback about our faculty for matters that do not pertain either to the topic or to hand surgery. I think that is uncalled for and is not going to be entertained by AO North America. This is not just my opinion. This is the opinion of the AO North America Hand Education Committee. And I think it's important that you understand that the faculty who are here today or who have been with us all along are doing it because they believe in education and to share their love, our, our love for the subject of hand surgery. So if you have something personal to say about our faculty, you may feel free to email me at cmudgal at mgh.harvard.edu. I repeat, cmudgal.mgh.harvard.edu. Otherwise, I would please, please request you to keep all your comments and discussions to the subject at hand or the subject of hand surgery. Thanks very much, Kyle, all yours. Thank you, Chai. A few points, if I can get my slide to advance, here we go. So uh, just some financial disclosures. Uh, there are a couple of people who have potential conflicts of interest. Both of those people have had their conflicts of interest resolved prior to tonight's session. And at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to John Elfar, who will take it from here. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, good evening. Um, this is what we uh, are supposed to talk about. I want to thank everybody for letting me uh, uh, talk um, today about scaphoid fractures. We're going to cover some initial uh, topics that I think everybody is going to be excited about. What you should see on your screen is one slide with no pictures on it right now. Um, uh, and um, there are some Zoom etiquette uh, Okay. Uh, there's some Zoom etiquette issues. Uh, uh, just make sure your microphones are muted. Um, so we're going to talk about the fracture and the diagnosis. We're going to talk about operative versus non-operative management. We're going to talk about factors that lead to non-union, displacement. We're going to talk about stability. Uh, and we're going to talk a little bit about evaluating healing. Um, uh, so here's an overview. This is a quote from one of my fellowship director's talks. And uh, uh, it says, a study of the extensive literature on the subject of navicular non-union is not conducive to peace of mind for the surgeon. Uh, there are too many alternatives. This was uh, many years ago. The scaphoid is a critical bone. Uh, it's the link from the proximal to the distal row. Uh, acute fractures can be missed. Um, uh, and uh, mi minimal initial pain is often dismissed in young patients. Non-unions are not rare, they're difficult to treat, and arthrosis uh, with non-union is predictable. Um, uh, so let's talk about the bone, uh, the scaphoid bone. So here's the slide that says it all. This is from John Capo in, uh, at NYU. Um, the scaphoid bone represents about 80% uh, or so of uh, fractures uh, uh, um, uh, in the in the carpus, and when you look here at, at this diagram, about seventy percent of those fractures are in the midsection of the scaphoid, uh, and uh, the scaphoid is very easy to image, uh, but 
The x-rays don't always reveal these fractures. Uh, this is an MRI, of course, of a reasonable appearing scaphoid. This is an actual uh, specimen of a scaphoid. It is a bone you could probably swallow. I have this uh, picture here to remind all of us that uh, the, uh, the most important blood supply to the scaphoid is from the dorsum, the dorsal carpal branch of the radial artery, and 19% of of people only have one little branch entering the scaphoid. And this may be a reason why proximal pulls far away from this entry point, proximal pull injuries don't do so well. Um, uh, uh, oh, okay. Um, so th there's an issue of whether or not we're, uh, we're missing something and classifications for scaphoid fractures. We're gonna use words like stability. Well, what does stability actually mean? Stability has to do with whether or not the fracture pieces are moving while the scaphoid is immobilized, whether or not those pieces have already moved to the point where healing is unlikely. And we're, what we're gonna say is what the literature says, which is about a millimeter of displacement is that point. Um, there are many classifications of scaphoid fractures. Um, and there are many orientations you can see here with, where my mouse is, orientations of scaphoid fractures. And generally these proximal pole fractures do uh, more poorly than uh, fractures in the distal portion or the waist. And these represent, as I showed you before, about 20% of injuries. This is an unstable fracture. And what you're gonna see here is, is that this fracture represents a twisting of the scaphoid, not just uh, a displacement like a distal radius, for example. Um, okay, classifications do not predict fracture union, and that's important. There are many classifications. This is an, uh, this is an older result um, uh, from 1999, Compton, Herbert, Rousset classification systems. The inter-observer reproducibility was only fair, and none of them predicted union. Uh, assessments of uh, the fracture level, comminution, uh, and displacement showed some uh, uh, intra-observer reproducibility. But this is, this is a bit of an art uh, more than a science, uh, judging stability. And when we say stability, that's what we meant, what I just said, uh, about a millimeter. Um, <clears throat> assessing instability or displacement. What we're interested in or what, what I'm interested in is, is the fracture truly non-displaced or is it displaced? greater than a millimeter? Is there flexion, twisting, uh, a humpback deformity? Uh, is that deformity more than 20 degrees? Um, uh, is there associated carpal disruption? Um, uh, is the fracture location in a bad place, like the proximal third, far away from that vessel, that, that single vessel that could be entering the scaphoid? And is this uh, fracture at risk for avascular necrosis? All of these have impingements on how you, uh, all of these impinge on how you treat a scaphoid fracture. Assessment of vascularity. There's, there has been historically a question about the MRI. The diagnostic uh, accuracy of MRI compared to histology for AVN is really high. Look here at this line. Um, 10 out of 10 accuracy in this, in this paper, uh, 30 years old. Um, surgeons are almost as good. X-rays are not very good at all. That's the point of this, uh, of this slide. Bone scans are really probably no longer even relevant for this question, at least that's arguable. MRI for the acute fracture. I'm a big believer in MRIs. Um, uh, when you look at a scaphoid, you have a very high likelihood of seeing a good scaphoid. This is an immediately after an injury. And if you ask 40 people, as I did, uh, is there a scaphoid fracture? About 38 of them will say, no, this is fine. It's a good scaphoid. And yet an MRI reveals a clear fracture. Um, and this fracture is at risk. These are the Peter Stern uh, arrows. These, this fracture is at risk for displacement. And it is at risk for uh, uh, avascular necrosis because of its position. And now, of course, when you stare at this x-ray, you can see something maybe something cortical line and, and, uh, and that sort of thing. So these are sometimes easy, it's easy to miss a scaphoid fracture, um, especially early after the injury. We care uh, uh, about trying to assess avascular necrosis. There's many ways to do this. In surgery, you can look at punctate, punctate bleeding like Dr. Green um, uh, uh, wrote in, the, in, in his textbook. Histology uh, reveals osteonecrosis 
that starts in the center of the devascularized portion of the scaphoid. Um, and it's standard avascular necrosis from the pathologist's perspective. Uh, it predominates centrally. That's the area of the sc proximal scaphoid that strokes out most reliably. Okay, CT for diagnosis of fractures and non-unions. CT, should we image in the longitudinal axis of the scaphoid? This was a question that was actually really relevant and you could, there was actually right and wrong answers before uh, the technology got better. Uh, and I'm gonna show you what, what I mean by that. CT is a good uh, uh, imaging technique for diagnosing scaphoids. It's certainly better than these things I wrote meh next to, uh, like, uh, uh, like cineradiography. Arthur Brands, uh, and I'm gonna, I have a case, if we end up having time and you want a case, I have a case of, of, uh, uh, of arthroscopy for diagnosis. Uh, it is good for confirming non-unions. It's good for evaluating degenerative uh, joint disease. Uh, I think a lot of people nowadays use CT scans for confirmation of union. I do, uh, and we can argue about that later. And it's great for assessing humpback deformities. What is this longitudinal axis CT? These are the images that, uh, that uh, depict what that actually is. It's a CT scan where the, the gantry of the CT scanner is geared towards the axis of the scaphoid. And this was really important uh, years ago when the technology for CT scans were not as good. Ask any radiologist nowadays and they'll tell you, you know what, they don't, uh, they don't uh, feel very strongly about this anymore. I personally do not and I've never used these uh, dedicated longitudinal axis CTs um, uh, but they, they're, they're something that a lot of people feel strongly about. Here is a dedicated longitudinal axis image of a, of a scaphoid fracture. Uh, this is a, a sagittal image uh, showing a scaphoid fracture that's actually not acute, this particular image. Okay, let's talk about the treatment. The basis for immobilization of the scaphoid fractures is a very old uh, concept. It started in military recruits uh, where uh, patients were diagnosed early, uh, and they were immobilized very early, immediately after the fracture. Immobilization was in plaster, and it was for an extensive period of time, usually at least three months, and it extended in some patients to over six months. Uh, they had a high incidence of union reported, but they had poor follow-up, and most importantly, these uh, military recruits were immobilized longer than we typically allow uh, our patients typically allow us to immobilize them. Healing in those types of studies was incredibly high. Look here at the percentage of healing, uh, very high. Uh, but these studies are very, very old. Um, the factors influencing treatment, they include things like stability, which is what I was telling you about earlier. Uh, Avascular necrosis, or more specifically, I probably should have written the likelihood of avascular necrosis in the proximal pole. Uh, very difficult to know at the outset, but uh, the more proximal fracture is, the higher that likelihood. Degenerative changes. A patient need not present to us with a, uh, with a scaphoid fracture immediately afterwards, and sometimes uh, the horse is out of the barn uh, with regards to degenerative changes. The location of the fracture, we've beaten to death the geometry of the fracture, these more oblique longitudinal fractures of the scaphoid, they have a tendency towards instability um, and, uh, uh, and natural history uh, <clears throat> of these fractures. We know that uh, many uh, of these uh, fractures uh, can uh, go on to non-union. Non-operative management in a cast, that's an important concept. About 90% of patients do well. And when we, when we talk about this, uh, there are people who feel very strongly about one first form of immobilization over another. And so the long arm thumb spica cast had historically been an absolute must for these. Uh, and here's a picture of a long arm thumb spica cast. You can imagine patients do not like being in this cast. That The justification comes from studies like these from about 20 years ago, where they did stereophotogrammatic analysis. Uh, and they showed that uh, they had a displacement of about one millimeter and it was largest in radial deviation during pronation. And it's these two facts that made people say, well, you gotta lock out pronosupination and you gotta lock out radial and ulnar deviation of the wrist. What's important is, is that when they measured total displacement, that is from the radial to the ulnar deviated wrist, they found uh, that in the unloaded wrist, they had greater than three millimeters of displacement. And in the loaded wrists, they had 4.1 millimeters, which is considered by everyone really unacceptable. 
So although there's a rationale for the long arm uh, uh, cast, uh, the cast has never really been shown in literature to really matter very much. So there's a th short arm thumb spike a cast versus long arm thumb spike a cast. And these are just a, uh, there, this is just a couple of papers of what has become many papers in the literature to suggest that there's no difference in union rate, pain, grip strength, time to union, or osteonecrosis using a short arm cast. That's probably because a lot of short arm casts limit pronosupination pretty well, and all of them limit uh, um, radial and ulnar deviation. Uh, and people have gone on to show that the thumb spica portion might not be important. I still use thumb spica uh, short arm casts when I use these non-operatively. And the long-term results of scaphoid fractures managed this way, 56 patients, this is one of many papers, 56 patients at an average of 36 years post-fracture. And uh, the United uh, Fractures, pretty, uh, uh, pretty uh, um, low incidence of arthritis, low incidence of symptoms, ununited fractures, rare, in, it's a rare thing, but a large amount of them get arthritis, a large amount of them get uh, symptoms, very, very significant result. And other studies have shown this since then. Operative management, there are many, and I'm not going to talk specifically about these different things. I'm hoping that the conversation goes towards there, um, uh, uh, but you should know that there's percutaneous fixation. There's open fixation with pins and screws and multiple screws and plates uh, without graft, with graft, uh, that's structural or non-structural, and also vascularized autograft. All of these have a role in certain uh, fractures. Operative management of scaphoid fractures is reserved for displaced fractures or unstable ones using that definition of uh, stability. Proximal pole fractures with and without displacement, we believe that these are not stable uh, or not likely to heal quickly. Transscaphoid perilunate and other sort of greater arc injuries. Uh, ipsilateral extremity fractures, where we're going to try to move the patient early out of a cast and early returns, <coughs> return uh, needs like, uh, like surgeons are, are often uh, sports uh, figures. I, I, uh, I carry a CAQ in sports, so a lot of uh, professional athletes are treated operatively for this reason. Um, uh, surgical approaches, the volar and the dorsal, these are sort of the mainstays of open approaches. Uh, 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 the volar approaches preserve the vascular supply because that because of that slide I showed you right in the beginning. Um, it's easier to correct scaphoid deformities through the volar approach. Dorsal approaches are really good too. Sometimes we all use both of these. Uh, scaphocapitate syndrome we're not going to talk about very much, but the proximal pole is easier to see and fix. Uh, from the dorsal approach, uh, and it preserves the radiocarpal ligaments. I don't know that this is a very big issue in the operative cases I've treated. Uh, yes, you're supposed to treat proximal pole fractures operatively. There's tons of literature on this, but this is a recent, uh, a relatively recent uh, paper. Uh, 34 progressed to non-union proximal poles that were treated non-operatively. Yes, you're supposed to treat displaced fractures operatively. Um, uh, relatively high non-union rate and displaced fractures treated in a cast. Non-union, uh, these are the last couple of slides here. Uh, the natural history of scaphoid, non scaphoid non-union has been investigated, not to death, but it has been investigated. And uh, early on, you see changes only in the scaphoid, but then it progresses over the next two decades to pancarpal degenerative joint disease. Uh, and uh, in another study, 56 of un, uh, 50, that included 56 untreated scaphoid uh, non-unions, about 100% of them, almost all of them, 97%, uh, went to progress to some form of degenerative joint disease uh, after uh, five years. So the incidence and the incidence increases with time. So I think that it's pretty clear that non-unions can lead to problems problems uh, um, uh, uh, if left untreated. Non-unions have been classified as well. I don't want to belabor the point, uh, but uh, the displacement of the non-union itself has, uh, has uh, relevance. And people measure angles of scaphoid relative to lunate um, uh, to see whether or not non-unions themselves are, are unstable. Um, I'm not going to talk much about that. Um, uh, okay, so the results and the assessment of uh, healing. We have copper, if you're talking just about the non-displaced fractures, I think the literature is pretty clear that there are compar comparable results for operative and non-operative management. And I think most people believe that. The non-displaced stable fractures do well in a cast. Uh, 
um, it, especially if they're monitored so that you can weed out of the, that pool the people who are not going to go on to heal. As in these studies, uh, uh, 28 treated in a cast, 25 treated with a percutaneous fixation, pretty minimal, fi uh, minimal um, uh, uh, surgical hit, uh, and they had no significance in union rate or time to union. However, assessing whether or not a scaphoid is healed becomes an issue in some of these studies. I think most people believe that CT scans sometime between four and 10 weeks uh, after uh, treatment has been initiated is sort of a, a gold standard for figuring out whether there's bone bridging. This comes from studies of other things like intervention A versus intervention B and the CT scan is used. Um, people who are tr be being treated non-operatively, we check C I check CT scans a little earlier in this period, like four or six weeks to decide on whether or not healing is progressing. But in operative cases, I usually delay that same study because I'm interested in knowing whether or not the surgery worked. I want to give the surgery as much time as possible. So many of us have a different standard for operative and non-operative management in this range. And you want to be careful about bone bridging because, you know, anybody can call one little spicule of bone, bone bridging. But that, that spicule can resorb if there's too much motion, especially when you're thinking of taking a patient out of a, uh, an immobilization um, uh, early. Um, uh, sometimes ser serial radiographs are definitely sufficient and people will make an argument about that. I typically use a CT scan at least once in the management of these uh, injuries. So the take home message, what messages, what did we talk about? Scaphoid fracture diagnosis, uh, operative versus non-operative treatment, fractures that lead to non-union, which are displacement, this issue of stability as, uh, as a proxy, I'm sorry, this issue of displacement as a proxy for stability, uh, and proximal pulp fractures, assessing healing. The take home message here is that scaphoid fracture management is evolving to include newer ways of thinking about fracture stability as a predictor of the need for fixation. Um, uh, 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 this is my uh, group at Penn State, uh, we are, and I want to thank you for allowing me to talk today. Thank you, John, that was great. Um, I have a couple follow-up questions before we go to our next section with uh, David Dennison. Uh, first, I'd like to ask Gary, um, Gary, when do you like to see patients for initiation of therapy after non-operative treatment, and is that different for patients who've had surgery? There are a couple of things um, for non-operative treatment, as long as their fingers are moving well and everything else is okay, you know, edema is under control, then we don't need to see them until there's, there's evidence of healing because then we'll start them. A lot of times we'll transition them from a cast to what we call a functional cast, which can act is basically a cast, but we'll just remove it very carefully for if they're with a reliable patient um, in therapy to start, typically when there's evidence on CT scan for healing and then we'll start them going. Right, and does that vary with surgical patients if they've- Surgical had... patients typically earlier, a lot of times for the surgical patients, we may go directly to the functional cast. Um, we can control it a little bit more for edema and dressing changes and, and, and wound checks, et cetera. Um, usually about three to four weeks or so, we'll, we'll start yeah. them with gentle motion. Yeah, it's interesting. I think, you know, those of us who, uh, who do treat a lot of these surgically, even some of the non-displaced fractures, the trend has been to get them moving earlier and earlier if they're reliable patients so that you can avoid some of the secondary consequences of prolonged mobilization after surgery, knowing that if you have stable internal fixation with a good compression screw, they're unlikely to displace. So I think that's a really important point in terms of minimizing the morbidity of treatment in these patients. Sometimes recovery is actually faster with surgery than with closed casting. Agree. Thank you for that. Uh, Chuck Cassidy, can I ask you a question, Chuck? Are you here? Absolutely. So, you know, we hear a lot of talk about MRI and CT scan evaluation and scaphoid fracture. When do you like, when do you personally like to use CT and when do you like to use MRI in evaluating scaphoid fractures, both acute and chronic injuries? Um, I'm sure. Yeah, I appreciate uh, John's comments. Um, MRI is very sensitive. It may be uh, too sensitive in some instances where you can have a, a quote, bone bruise of the scaphoid uh, without a fracture, um, it, uh, whereas the CT is better for looking at actually cortical break. Um, and so for me, if I want to prove that there is a scaphoid fracture, I know it's broken, I just want to prove it, I get a CT. If I know there's something 
bad going on with the wrist, but I'm not sure what it is, I'll get an MRI. And then in terms of treatment of non-unions, do you prefer MRI looking at vascularity or do you think CT is more reliable in terms of collapse and resorption? What's your protocol for evaluating a non-union that comes into your office, say nine to 12 months after injury? What's your go-to evaluative study? Um, well, uh, um, as John kind of alluded to, the, the proximal pole non-unions tend to be better aligned, uh, whereas collapse occurs at uh, more in the waist. Um, so I, I look at it, at, you know, in terms of the structural issues for a waist fracture, I would definitely uh, get a CT over an MR. Uh, MR, I would say it's very common to see altered vascularity to the scaphoid, and that is not necessarily synonymous with avascular necrosis. Um, and so for me, if it's been, you know, if it's, if it's been uh, nine or 12 months uh, and the patient truly has avascular necrosis, you're gonna see it on a plain X-ray. Um, and so that is sufficient for me in terms of assessing the vascularity. Um, you know, occasionally I'll get it for proximal pole, uh, but in, in, in general, I use CT to evaluate for, you know, structural issues in terms of the type of graft the approach, surgical approach, uh, MRI, uh, more for proximal pole. But I think, you know, if it's longstanding, the x-rays tell the story. Uh, good points, thank you. Chai, one last question before we go on to Dave's session. Um, what are your thoughts about CT evaluation of healing. Do you feel that a CT scan is always necessary to determine that a patient has healed after treatment, either with casting or with surgery? So um, my answer may be a little biased. That's the first disclaimer. I do believe that a CT is essential. Um, in the old days, we used to rely on only on uh, plain radiographs. And I found that it is not uncommon to have plain radiographs look promising, only to have patients come back a year or two later with this supposed uh, non-union or a new fracture. And so I started uh, doing radiographs, uh, CT scans at about 12 to 14 weeks. I initially used to do two sets of CTs, one at eight weeks and one at uh, 12 to 14 weeks. And the problem with doing one too early was that the, the radiologist report always said partial union, which caused the patient some concern. So I eliminated that and just go to one for 12 to 14 weeks. And what we found that uh, 12 to 14 weeks, if you have 50% union of trabecular uh, growth across the fracture site, that is a reasonable guideline to say that's healed. So I uh, have become, the pendulum for me has swung the other way. I use CT mm -hmm. all the time for union. Okay. But it's a biased response. I do have some data, but it's biased. Yeah. Well, I think all of us have our biases and some of our treatment is, is inherently anecdotal. And so it's good to get opinions from a lot of experts. So thank you all for your comments. Um, Dave, you want to take it from here and share your screen with us? Thanks, everybody. Sure. Uh, welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining us this evening. Uh, hopefully mine will come up here. Uh, let's see. Okay, sorry everybody. All right, so um, hopefully everybody can see that. Um, so first of all, I just wanted to thank my colleagues here, uh, also my teachers and my patients for all the stuff I've learned. And some of my colleagues added some cases for this and in particular, also, I'd like to thank uh, AO and everybody who's taken the time to visit with us and John for giving us a great introduction so I can have a little more uh, fun with uh, jumping into some cases. Um, I think what I would like, again, keeping in mind that this is for uh, essentials, um, I would like to have um, everybody make sure that they can understand the different types of scaphoid non-union and then choose a treatment plan for displaced and non-displaced fractures figure out when you wanna use a structural graft or need to use one as well as Kinsella's graft and when you're gonna consider a vascularized graft as well as determining um, when, it's, when it's healed or not. Um, the uh, scaphoid and data, you know, you need to know what, who you're dealing with, well, how old they are, if there's arthritis and John talked about a lot of this, so I won't go into too much, but understanding their activity level, if they're gonna smoke uh, through the trying, you know, trying to get this to heal CT is very helpful understanding the alignment if there's arthritis or other problems. And you can really, I do use this scaphoid oblique to understand the, the uh, deformity of the scaphoid and understand how much we need to fix it. 
Um, MR, we do look at for AVN. I think it's a combination of looking at your imaging as well as um, um, if it's bleeding or not at the time of surgery and then deciding about salvage. Now, I went out on a limb here. I, I took a different approach to this. I think that if everybody is looking at these uh, for the first couple times, you really have to have an understanding of what types of non-unions are you going to deal with. There's lots of classifications, atrophic, and if they're displaced and lots of things, but a lot of them come down to whether they have a humpback deformity like this or whether they're cystic like this or if they're a proximal pole and there's hopefully not too much displacement. Um, and don't forget about the ones that we create, sort of, if you will, the ones that we operated on and they didn't work. So I find that pictures are easier than words. So I drew a couple of pictures to see if this will help. And we'll start with the humpback ones. And basically just understanding that um, with the humpback, you need to extend it and reduce it, whether you use an old school iliac crest, distal radius bone graft, MFC, anything else. And then whether you're gonna use a screw, uh, some people are using K wires, and cancellous graft or screw and graft only. Some people are using plates. Again, K-wires, PC hose showing that this can work. And then uh, Steve Lee and, and Scott Wolf showed a modified reset technique. If you're gonna look at the proximal ones and you have cystic graft, uh, excuse me, a cystic uh, non-union, you might be able to fix this in situ, maybe add some graft to it. If there is a defect or a deformity here, along with that, we found uh, Alan Bishop in particular, and, um, the group here has found that the if there's a higher degree of deformity, that something like an inlay 1-2 ICS array is not as reliable for healing. So keep that in mind as well. So this is, um, excuse me one second, I just have to play with one part of my section here. Um, I apologize. Um, Kyle, I just can't see anybody on the side, so if anybody's trying to reach me. This is a case, it was a 16 year old who had uh, presented months after an injury. And I only mention this because it, it's a child or young person, had no previous treatment. So in this case, you wanna consider just adopting a, an initial conservative measure, some measures like casting. And in this case, this went on to heal just with cast application, possibly, a consideration for some stimulation. So not every non-union needs an operation is the take home, especially in kids. If it's been a year, that's probably not gonna work. But if it's been maybe two months, you might consider it. If we go up a little bit into a more of a cystic kind of appearance, this fracture is kind of looking a little bit older than maybe a few weeks or a few months. And um, it's not terribly displaced, maybe a little bit of lunate extension, but it may be acceptable position overall. This type of non-union could be treated with um, potentially some graft. And this is a case that Peter reloaned me from a previous AO talk. And you can kind of make use of a smaller approach, dorsal approach here. You can start your guide wire, put your screw, uh, to put your um, drill through, and then you may use a trephine or maybe a bone marrow biopsy needle to get some core biopsies, get some cancellous graft, and you can kind of stuff it down there, maybe back drill it a little bit, impact it and place your screw. And that can be an easy way to kind of get that sort of inside to maybe minimally displaced fracture that just looks like it's struggling to get onto a, a better course. Um, here's an example from Peter showing the healing uh, progression in this fracture. Um, one mention just to really quickly, I just like to mention this. If you're gonna use any kind of a perk um, or a small open technique, something that was taught to me by Dr. Verber was uh, that just make sure you can see that SL canal, just make sure that you're seeing a PA of the proximal pole. So when you start, you're really starting in what you think is the middle and that can be very helpful on your rotation. Just make sure you can see the SL interval nicely. Another case, uh, now we're going to a proximal pole fracture. This is one that looks like it's struggling a bit. Maybe there's some MR findings of, you know, doesn't look great here. So we're gonna go on to just presume that we're gonna use a vascularized graft and I think the workhorse for us here in a non-displaced uh, basically fracture would be a 1-2 ICS array, which um, it's become pretty common knowledge, I think. Peter Ray and Alex Shin did a nice review of this um, just for, an ex for a reference here, but that um, we just basically use an incision over the EPL. We can find that artery and then pull our plug and rotate it into the scaphoid. Uh, again, the 1-2 is gonna be pretty easy to find and we're gonna open the a cuff on each side so we can just spare the vessel. Um, this is a picture, a nice one that Steve had for us showing the vessel, again, the incision by the EPL. We can make a nice dissection on either side of this. 
and where it's adherent to the bone, preserve that for our, our plug later, uh, which is Steve is just, he's doing there. In this case, distal is top, proximal is bottom. The pedicle is right here. We're preparing the scaphoid, and then this will rotate under the second compartment into the scaphoid. Um, when you're doing this, this is just a case I did not too long ago. Uh, we kind of want to figure out the size of the trough. Um, most of the time, what you want to do is don't exsanguinate the hand completely so you can find the vessel. Prepare the scaphoid first. Don't destabilize it too much. Debride it, and we tend to put the screw in and the K-wire so we don't lose stability there. Then you can kind of cut out the brick size defect you need to place your graft. Then you can go, uh, assuming that all went successfully, uh, and cure out the rest of the scaphoid that you need to, that or whatever you need to out of the proximal pole. You can then take this graft size, match it on the radius. Hopefully you can see my cursor. And then you can make your trough and your cut and your depth. And we often will use a side cut, just using an osteotome to make this relief cut. And then you can scoop underneath and you won't break your graft. You can take this, put it into here, and then usually we try to make it fit well enough that it really impact nicely. After you've put some cancellous graft in the bottom and into the proximal pole, you can kind of lay the brick in there. I think of it more like into a little bit of mortar. You're kind of putting it in, bone graft around it. And then finally, do the final graft compression with the screw now after the graft is in. So kind of have the screw about here and then just do the final compression and hopefully that will hold your graft in. Um, this is just an example here, 12 week, I agree. I do a CT closer to 10 to 12 weeks for the surgical cases. In this one, you can see we also place the volar screw. It's a little bit palmer on purpose with a smaller screw so we have room for the inlay graft. Another example from Steve, um, just showing when they get really small, you can maybe take your graft a little bit thinner. In this case, the graft probably went in vertically just to bring in a nice pedicle of uh, bone and blood supply. Another way to do it, I won't go into details, but Dean Steriano shows a capsule graft if you prefer on the fourth compartment, another way to rotate that bone into the scaphoid. Again, not, to, not when it's too displaced. What if you have something like this, not to go too far into this, but this is a very proximal pole fracture. We looked at this, talked about a lot of things. He has pain, he can't shoot baskets. And um, you can see it's very small. And if they get really small and they don't involve the SL, in this case, it was very volar. I didn't think I could fix this. There are other ways you can reconstruct it. Um, in this case though, based on the intact dorsal SL, we chose excision in this case. The type two lunate here might help with some stability of the wrist as well. So some, my point here is sometimes you really have to think, you know, can I really fix that? Can I get a screw in it? Can I, can I do, I didn't think I could fix that one without going on to a bigger reconstruction. He's done pretty well. He's three years out on that one right now. Okay, so that's a couple things about proximal pole. Moving into the waist, this is the meat and potatoes part. If you see um, this wrist has some lunate extension, you can see the DC deformity here, captate riding up dorsal. It doesn't really look like much on the plain x-ray, but the CT shows a pretty good humpback deformity, flex scaphoid. So we need to think about how we're gonna get that extended. I, it doesn't matter how you do it, iliac crest, distal radius from here, you can do a wedge graft from here. You can use an MFC. I'm gonna show you one case where we used uh, the modified Rousset technique just because I like it. It tends to work for me. We can use a graft from the same arm. We don't have to go to the hip. And basically you can debride the, open the fracture, wedge it open with this stick, cancellous graft in and then put your screw in. The trick is to get it from here to here, get it extended, make sure it's stable. Uh, this is their paper. We can use a little surfboard of bone from here to put into here and then add the screw along with the cancellous graft. If you do that approach, you're gonna need uh, the, the workhorse volar approach. Um, basically, the only thing I wanted to mention here is just beware the palmocutaneous branch can cross the FCR here, whether you use a Bruner or a zigzag or a, of a hockey stick type incision. Here's an example on an FCR from when a distal radius case we were doing not too long ago. Um, and you can see that branch crossing, just protect it. Deeper, we're gonna go through the, I tend to still do just a, a classic incision here. There are other ways to make a flap to try to avoid that, but I think as long as the lunate and the long radial lunate are okay, we don't run into too much trouble. Um, a bump and extending the wrist is critical to help see into the fracture. And you may also use a laminar spreader to look in there pretty nicely. Um, you can see the distal pole here, proximal spreader here to open it up and uh, to work inside that. You can also use a radio lunate or even a radio scaphoid pin to hold the proximal pole if you need to. Uh, we can extend, extend it, 
You can slip that graft. You can see the cortical strut. And then we've added cancellous graft, and then we can put the screw in once the, once the scaphoid is reduced. And I think you can see that the lunate looks a little bit better here, less extension. And we've done it all within a, just a small extension, just like everybody uses for a, a volar plate. Uh, this is going on to heal. Uh, CT scan at 12 weeks, not the perfect one. You do have to be aware of bridging, but you can see nicely where that strut is there and the screw is there. Kind of a small scaphoid too. This was a small female, but the scaphoid sagittal oblique is shown here. Um, again, I won't go into this because it's been discussed. Um, I think that whole thing about 50% at 12 weeks is a pretty reliable thing to go on and let people use their wrist if it looks healed at 50% bridging at 12 weeks. This was basically looking at non, uh, or, uh, non-operative treatment. But basically, if around 12 to 18 weeks, if these fractures in uh, Dr. Singh's study of non-operative scaphoids, if they had some bridging by this time, they all went on to heal. So bridging, as long as there's some at that point, is reassuring. If there's none, you probably should be concerned about that. Um, okay, so we did waste with a humpback deformity. Here's another example. Um, this one's a little bit, again, that doesn't look over doesn't really look too terrible, but we can see a cyst here, extension. Not a tremendous intrascaphoid angle elevation here, 71 degrees, but I still felt this was a struggling, maybe some vascularity issues, and we chose to go volar on this one. We chose to use a different graft in this case. Uh, Dr. Mathlin showed that this can be a good graft, palmerly, um, as long as you um, preserve the volar carpal uh, artery. Uh, their study was a little bit, you have to be careful. They didn't say that it's particularly used for ischemic necrotic fractures. Uh, most of their fractures are a little bit better than that, but it's something that we have used in cases. Here's from his uh, report. It's not too hard. Again, it's in a very common area where we all work for distal radius fractures. I think that has some merit. Um, you can isolate the artery, elevate your, your graft, and then you can move right over to insert it into your reduced scaphoid position. So it's one you should have in your armamentarium. It's not too hard, it's right there. You do have to be careful on the exposure that you don't go through that vessel. You see it most of the time when you're doing a distal radius graft. Here's just a K-wire showing so I don't get too far into the radius reduction. You can see the edge of the graft in there. And then we have made sure that our screw goes across the, gra across the fracture. All the th screws are across. You can use either short or long threads. We used long threads here. Fortunately, they went all the way across. And I think you can see a little less DC in this case. Went on to heal, the CT looks okay. A little sclerotic. This is not uncommon to see a lagging appearance of sclerotic bone. Fortunately, I think it's healed by the CT. So he's gone, he's about four years out now with good outcome. And I think healing has to be assessed in long-term as well. You know, I follow them out through a year at least just with plain x-rays. Um, just to mention some contrarians, um, some people will say, why don't you just reduce it, use a fully threaded screw and cancellous graft. Mark Cohn and Jesse Jupiter have shown that can work. I've seen that fail where the screw falls down on the threads. I don't particularly like it compared to a, a structural graft. And I'm a disciple of Alan Bishop on that. I think if something in there makes sense. Um, PC Ho has also shown that you can do this with cancellous graft. So it's not that you can't. I just think a structural graft is a little more reliable. Um, so I'm right at about 15 minutes. Uh, I'm just gonna, Kyle, if it's okay, I'll just show a couple of cases of what if it didn't work and I can wrap it up sooner if you need me to. No, Dave, you're doing great on time. So please continue and just give us what you want. Okay, great. Um, what if it didn't heal? It's important to know these because a lot of the times you, you're gonna have these and sometimes you cause them and sometimes you didn't and it doesn't matter because the patient's sitting there going, what are you gonna do for me? Um, so a couple things. This is one I did in, in fellowship it just didn't heal. We saw him back with Dr. Cooney and it just wasn't healing. And you can see here, it's just not going on to union. So we kind of chose to go uh, into this a little bit sooner. This is an older CT, but you know, there's not a lot of room for another pin up here, excuse me, another screw up here. So maybe you're gonna use a plate or something else. In this case, we used um, a vascularized graft. This is a right wrist looking from ulnar to radial. And um, Dr. Cooney at that point, we used a big graft. This is the hole in the scaphoid. And we went ahead and just inlaid that. We used the K wires for the reduction. Um, not super pretty, but it worked. And uh, so you have to remember sometimes you just have to go back and K wires with a structural graft are pretty powerful. You do need to use a cast, I think. And I think in these cases, I even use a long arm and it's not so much to absolutely control the stability, but I think it's a behavior monitor uh, 
um, to kind of help your K-wires not get into trouble, at least maybe for the first six weeks. Okay, here's a guy I took care of, did not take care of it. My screw might have been a little dorsal initially. I can't even tell anymore. But I mean, I think we all look into the go into the room and look at this one and go, oh boy, that's not so good. Um, there are some options to fix it, but this guy, he doesn't want to do any more surgery. He smokes. He doesn't want the time to fix it, but maybe he doesn't need a four corner either. I don't know that I want to do a four corner if he can't stop smoking or give me time to let it heal. So in this case, we went with just a distal scaphoid excision and we'll deal with it a little bit later. He's got a type two lunate that may protect him a little bit. It might not, but uh, you can't fix them all. So have some other tricks. What if you need a strong vascularized graft? And this is something that uh, certainly Alan and Alex here, uh, Alex Shin and Alan Bishop have done a lot. I don't do them routinely. I do them with them when I have a case. Uh, but I think this is a case from Alan that just showed, you know, not a complete disaster, but a non-union, a little sclerotic, some deformity, a little bit of extension. Scaphoid uh, doesn't look too bad on the CT, a little sclerotic, cystic. It's going to need a graft. MR looking a little concerning, but maybe not completely dead. Uh, in any case, it was cho we, they chose at this point to go ahead with this. And just for the OIT that's coming up, you want to make sure that you know the, the blood supply to this. There are uh, two, the descending genicular and the supermedial genicular. Most of the time, we're taking it off of this, off the descending because it's a longer leash. There's a transverse and a longitudinal limb that we're going to use. And here you can see intraoperatively the same thing. Here's the longitudinal and the transverse branch. I won't go into this too much. This is the this is the quadrant that has the better number of perforators. Uh, probably not on the OIT, but you should know that anyway. And if you're going to come in here, here's the longitudinal. We're going to go down here for the graft. Um, Alan is great at harvesting these, and we can prepare the scaphoid at the same time. Here's our graft. Here's our pedicle. I won't go into too much. Alan has a wonderful video, so I'll just show it with you for a second. You can see the bleeding with the graft. It is a very, this is a large graft. Probably don't need one so big, but Alan always takes a good one, so it's never too small. Okay, and then we're gonna go on. We're gonna uh, distract it, place it in here, and then add the screw to it. Nice long scaphoid, the lunate's neutral again. And then you just have to be prepared to do your vascularized repair. So with two teams, that's a nice operation. By yourself, it's a little bit of a longer day, I think. And there it is healed. So. Just a couple ways. So make sure you understand the non-union. The CTA for me is very helpful. Make sure you choose an approach for your reduction that will allow you to see it, get what you need for the reduction and stability. So a one, two and the inlay graph should be reserved for I think the, the ones without deformity. And then um, beware, sometimes the proximal pole is gonna break. You're gonna have to do something else. So be prepared for those. Bone graft, uh, consider, I think you need to use excuse me, auto graft one way or the other. Rasterized graft, be prepared a couple different ways from the dorsum, volar, and then MFC might be an option. And then follow it until it's healed. CT for me, 10 to 12 weeks in most cases. And thank you for your time. Dave, that was great. Thank you very much. That was, you crammed a lot of really useful information and some great images into a relatively short time. I have a follow-up question for you and it's regarding that last case. For audience members who may not have a team to work with, or they may not have microsurgical capabilities or equipment, are there really any? <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> no worries. <It> quiet. <laughs> Sorry, doorbell. Uh, for for people who may not have microsurgical capabilities, <laughs> give me one sec. Kyle, I know where you're going with that question. May I ask it in while Moose is getting settled down? Yeah, I think I'm good. So <laughs> are there, sorry about that, everybody. Uh, are there any inherent benefits that have been proven with MFC free flaps over other forms of grafting for scaphoid non-union? Or is it just simply a surgical preference that you know some people have and that's why they use it? Yeah, I think uh, what I would say is that um, my summary for that, listening to Alan uh, talk about this a lot too, and he certainly is, knows more about it than I do, is that I think you can see union occur faster with vascularized grafts. Um, 
ultimate union can still be, you know, there's certainly a lot of people that would say you don't have to do this. It's too much and, and all that. So I don't think you, I, I don't like to do it, frankly, myself. I don't really go to it unless I really feel like I need to. But I think Alan would say that you can probably show improved union time uh, or time to union by a few weeks or so. And I think that's probably the main thing. Uh, their uh, main push for it is that, you know what, we can do it. It's a structural, it's strong. We can, it's reliable for us. And uh, granted, that's not for everybody. And a lot of us here don't do it all the time. We will go to these other techniques, Sanj will, I will, and just use it. We're nice. It's nice that we can use it as a backup here though. I don't think it's the cure-all for all of them. I guess my question was more differentiating between vascularized grafts like the 1-2 ICSRA or the Methulin graft versus the MFC free flat. Because I think we all agree that there are still roles for vascularized grafts over non-vascularized, but is there any inherent benefit of the MFC by itself relative to the other forms of vascularized bone grafting? Um, I think it. I would probably just, if I'm understanding the question, the question the best way you want me to, I think the biggest thing about it is it's structural and you can put it in the front and jack it open. I mean, you get that benefit in addition. Um, you know, the knee issue always comes up. Um, it's certainly, you know, we're lucky enough that um, I would say that here where Alan takes a lot of them and Alex, they do it a lot and they can get around and know where the you know, nerve branches are and worrying about that. If you're doing this on occasion, I think you might run into more trouble with that. And I, and I think I've seen a lot of the patients do well with this knee graft uh, without much big problems. Uh, but, you know, everybody's a little bit worried about that. So I think you should use it with, you know, when you have to team up, uh, don't do it on your own the first time, I think. And, uh, but I think that large chunk of bone is, is probably the main benefit in addition to, yeah. you know, being vascularized. Having said that, I mean, I've done a lot of methylene grafts and it's really my preferred vascularized graft for a mid waist humpback with pretty significant resorption. And I can get a really large piece of bone based on that volar radial cortical branch. So, um, you know, I think the jury is still out in terms of the true benefits as far as evidence-based evaluations of outcomes of the free flap from the knee versus local vascularized grafts. But, you know, I think it's important for people in the audience to know that there are a lot of options and that they shouldn't take take one person's or one team's approach as being the only way to address these. There are a lot of different ways to, to get non-unions to heal. And I'd like to bring Chai in at this point because I know Chai's bias and his data. So Chai, would you like to speak to that a little bit in terms of the utility of even needing a vascularized graft of any type, whether it's a regional graft or a free flap? Yeah, let me muddy the waters a little more. Yeah. Um, so, there's two large series that I know of which have looked at proximal pole non-unions um, and that have addressed them with non-vascularized bone grafts with just simple grafting and hardware. And one of them is from Mark Cohen and the other one is from Kristen Choji that is essentially my series over the last 20 years. And we looked at volume of the proximal pole and correlated it with the ability to predict ongoing non-union after grafting. And it showed that the volume of the proximal pole, which was as small as 7% of the scaphoid, did not correlate with healing or the ability to predict ongoing non-union. And Mark Cohen's series was also very similar. So that being said, I would urge everyone if you can, and I will try my hardest best to get Herb von Schroeder from Toronto to give us a talk on how to interpret vascularity of the proximal pole. Because Herb is very clear in understanding that avascular necrosis is a term that gets bandied about very, very easily. But there's a difference between dysvascularity and avascular necrosis. And what you do in either situation is a huge difference. So I'm going to try very hard to get Herb to give us that talk. And if not, uh, I'll find a way to get it to you guys. But Great. that is a critical difference. Thank you, Chai. Gary, can I ask you a question with with vascularized graphs, especially regional graphs like the one, two, the four, five, or the volar graft, there's a lot more stiffness typically for those patients after surgery due to the increased dissection, the tethering of the pedicle, and the healing that occurs after the more invasive surgery. Do you alter your approach and are there modalities that you like to use in order to try to address that excessive stiffness that results during healing? 
Sure, and, and it depends what phase they're in, but um, initially I just like them, I always emphasize natural movement at first. So more of the dart throwers in an elliptical pattern and trying to get people comfortable using their arm and, and a lot of bilateral type activities. Um, once they are, are safe to really start going, besides like heat and stretching, I do like to use some either static progressive or serial static splinting with them. Um, Serial static is a great way to start because you can just mold it into position and let them either spend an extended time, uh, extended period of time in the orthosis and then bring it back a little bit more. Um, I always go for extension over flexion and, and try to see what their, their needs are and sort of emphasize that motion too. Most people need to bias towards extension more than flexion. So I tend to go that way, but there have had some people, athletes who need more of a a follow through for flexion. So I, I try to base it on patient needs the direction, um, which I work on a little bit more than, than going all directions at the same time. How about ultrasound? Do you find it useful in these patients in terms of softening scar? Or do you feel it's a little bit worrisome with respect to vascularity? What's your feeling about it? You know, I don't think it's a magic wand. I, you know, tried it. I don't I think um, I've seen wonderful results with it versus not with it. I don't think there's great studies, you know, for its effectiveness. I always consider it as an adjunct to treatment, but um, I don't know if it's as magic wand as people sometimes give credit for. So I prefer things that people can do, heat and stretch and, and spending time at the end range and emphasizing, you know, gentle stretching versus any particular modalities other than a, a general heat modality. Great, thank you. Chai, I think you have a question from the audience. Yeah, so uh, I think this is a, it's a very good question and one that all surgeons deal with on a regular basis. Brian Foster asks, and this I'm going to throw it out to the panel here. How do you judge that you have adequate correction of your humpback? What tricks do you use to decide that your humpback is correct? Thank you, Brian. All yours, guys. Yeah, good question, so, John. You have a comment? Yeah, so I, the first thing I want to say is, is that I, I get a lot of hump packs. I don't know why. Maybe it's just something on my forehead. But, you know, the first thing I want to say is, is that, you know, basically a healed scaphoid uh, does well, even with a little bit of deformity. These patients will lose some extension. But uh, I often have seen in, in my career, I've seen humpbacks that are in the 20 degree range um, that are healed. Uh, and so, uh, and, and those patients do okay, uh, at least in my experience. Uh, adequate correction in the operating room is a, an entirely different matter. Uh, I think that that fracture has a tendency to be undercorrected in, uh, in most people's hands. Uh, I like structural graft. I agree with what uh, Dave said about that. Um, but the goal is to get a scapegoat that's standing up. And I will go and print out and measure in the operating room uh, angles just to get to make sure it's standing up because it's never as stood up as it is in the operating room later. Uh, there is some settling. There's tremendous forces across the waist of the scaphoid. Um, and so I don't overcorrect, but I, own, I mean, I'm, I think that most of us uh, spent a lot of time making sure we didn't undercorrect, um, especially when cortical uh, graft uh, was called for. Uh, that's yeah, all I, I think those are good points. I, I would also add to that, um, there are different types of humpback deformity. There are subacute humpback deformities and there are the chronic long-standing humpback deformities with mid-carpal instability that you can't correct no matter what you do. And I think it's important to understand what your goals are in terms of treating these. If you have a really chronic non-union, it may be that you're really just trying to reestablish longitudinal stability and strength in the scaphoid and not so much address the mid-carpal instability because they're very, very difficult to correct. In the subacute, where they're more flexible and mobile, they have less ligamentous rigidity, then I think that it is worth trying to get that pump back and, and the secondary mid-carpal instability that results corrected. And the best way for me to assess that is on a true lateral looking at the lunocapitate axis. It's not so much the scaphalunate angle, which can be very difficult to assess in, in anybody's hands, it really varies a lot with only slight degrees of obliquity, but the, the lunocapitate axis is pretty easy to appreciate when it's in and when it's out of alignment. And that's how I decide when I've corrected it. And I use joysticks and the proximal and distal fracture fragments to really manipulate 
the scaphoid until I've corrected that. And then that's what I use as my template for screw fixation and my graft is to, to get that widely opened and get the capitate to sit back down in the concavity of the lunate. Chuck, you want to chime in here? Sure. Yeah, uh, thanks. I think those are great points. Uh, one, uh, one trick, if it's a mobile non-union uh, in DC, um, what you can do is correct the lunate tilt and with a radio lunate pin. So actually transfix the lunate in a neutral position. And when you do that, it will open up the scaphoid and you can see what the gap is. So that will give you a ballpark idea of uh, how much graft you need. I always take a little bit more than that. And I, I do like to inset it in, in either side. So make sure the graft's a little bit bigger um, and you can take an osteotome. So say six millimeter osteotome, stick it in there, give you a sense of uh, what the graft size is that you need. That's a pretty, uh, pretty simple uh, trick. Uh, one point I wanted to make sure we, uh, we didn't ignore um, uh, before, we, before we wrap it up. We, we've been talking a lot about compression screws. And it's very important to, uh, to remember that these are not traditional compression screws and they will not necessarily compress the bone um, if there's a significant gap. So if there's a gap in the fracture, because the screws are, are threaded, if you use a conical uh, screw, like a tapered screw or a screw with differential pitch at each end, it's essentially a gear and the, the, the screw is a gear into the bone at either end. And once it engages the bone, that relationship is fixed, okay? And so if it's, com if it's compressing, it's really translating the bones together. And if there's a significant gap, they, they may never ever touch. That's very different than a lag screw. So it's important to get good yeah. position, um, for example, or if you're doing it percutaneously, you want to make sure there's good contact. Good points. Chuck, you froze when you were making your first point, so I'm just going to paraphrase it for the audience. Uh, what they didn't hear was that you said that you want to correct the lunate tilt by using a radio lunate pin. You correct the rotation in the lunate and fix it temporarily with a radio lunate pin to keep it there, and that reduces your scaphoid, and I think that's a good little pearl. Um, Jeff, are you still here? Jeff Lawton? Jeffrey? Yep. Okay, question for you. When do you decide that a non-union is not salvageable? Yeah, so I think uh, David showed a nice one with that uh, exceedingly small proximal pull. Um, yeah. And I think if there's a you know very fragmented uh, proximal pull non-union, um, that's a tough one. Um, if you have what would be one tiny little piece and it's really three pieces, um, then I think there are some alternative reconstructions in terms of the medial femoral trochlear grafts or uh, cartilaginous grafts, et cetera. Uh, I think Dave had another nice example of that comminuted distal pull in someone who wasn't going to change their lifestyle. And um, in some select cases, you know, it's on a, a large case report series, a distal pull excision um, can be considered and, and is a good bailout. Um, the uh, Beyond that, I, I think that I try to salvage and save the non-unions. So um, Kyle, you asked the question before about, you know, maybe when does a medial femoral, femoral condylar graft filter in? And in our practice, we do one, two ICSRA, we do MFCs. Um, we usually use the, the big gun, the MFC for when it's sort of failed the traditional screw and carpentry. Um, and then there's a lot of central uh, loss. So you're excising a third of the scaphoid uh, to get to good bone. Um, and that's where I think an MFC works really well. Um, but I will say I, I probably don't go to it as early as a couple other centers do. Um, but I, I think there are, are salvages even for non-unions um, that, that can work most of the time. Yeah, those are good points. I think it's important to remember some of the literature related to outcomes for these cases. And Dave's group, Alex Shin, wrote a paper about 10 years ago looking at their retrospective cases after vascularized bone grafting. This was pre-MFC. They were looking at primarily 1-2 ICSRA. And one of the factors that doesn't get spoken about very often but was really statistically significant and was correlated with a poor outcome was long-standing non-unions of greater than five years. And we do occasionally see somebody pop into your office with a neglected non-union that's been there for a very, very long time. And even though it you know, may look tempting to try to salvage that with even a vascularized graft, you have to be 
aware that the outcomes are probably not going to be as good as in a more acute non-union. So it's something to consider in terms of whether to proceed or whether to just go to a salvage operation like a PRC or a four corner fusion. Kyle. Yeah, Chai. A question for Johnny. John, John, I know you've published a bit on this and I think it's important for the audience to hear it from the horse's mouth, so to speak. Uh, um, how critical is it to have this screw perpendicular to the fracture surface or the non-union surface? Yeah, muted. Uh, yeah, I so I believed it was when I you know when I read Tom Trumbull's article uh, about central location. Uh, I believed that, uh, that the position of the screw, the length of the screw, and its orientation relative to the fracture were very important. Uh, I don't know that I can say that now, uh, primarily because I see a lot of second opinion patients with screws uh, placed uh, along the long axis with oblique fractures that have healed. Uh, I believe in the AO principle of getting that screw as as perpendicular to the fracture line as possible. However, we're talking about a small bone and not everybody has the ability or skill set to go and find the right approach for that sort of screw. And having, having seen now get, got, getting older, a few more gray hairs, having seen some that were done according to that principle of getting the fracture, the screw absolutely perpendicular to the fracture, having seen a lot of them heal without that, um, uh, I, uh, I, maybe I've backed off of it a little bit. I will say also the length of the screw has not been a critical issue in my series of these. Uh, uh, the, having a screw that goes as long as possible, uh, maybe this is level 50 evidence as they say, but may, maybe that isn't as important in my experience uh, as it has been in the literature. I think that is a, that's perfect because it segues into my remark in that if you look at Jeffrey Fisk's original data and Diego Fernandez's original data, they did not have access to the compression screws that we have, thereby proving that compression and screw placement and angle of placement and perpendicularity to the fracture and non-union makes absolutely no difference. More importantly, more recently, Dan Nagel's series, where he just used K wires, showed that they heal just fine. So, and finally, if I may say, um, there is biomechanical data to show that when you put a screw into the scaphoid, in 24 hours, most of these screws will lose some degree of compression. So um, don't forget the 100 K wire, the biggest uh, secret kept in hand surgery. Yeah, I mean, so, and sometimes you just have to. I mean, has anybody struggled with a screw for a long time and, and just it just isn't turning out well and you end up with two K wires and the patient does fine? Uh, you know, the, the, this, this happens to all of us. And uh, Greg Summerkamp has, I, I have his case if we end up losing it. Greg Summerkamp has this great uh, example of arthroscopic assisted uh, scaphoid reduction and fixation. And, uh, you know, it's fixed and it's not perfect. That patient went on to heal uh, very well. And it looks perfect on the x-ray, but the arthros arthroscope tells all. Tells all. So I, I agree with everything you said. Becky, we're running a little bit short on time, so I want to give you the last word because you never fail to enlighten us with some of your pearls about therapy and, and rehab for these patients. So what do you have to say about what you've heard tonight and anything you can add from a therapeutic standpoint in terms of treating both acute and chronic scaphoid fractures and non-unions? Hey, thanks, Kyle. I think for me, the most important point, and I make this over and over again, is the collaboration between the surgeon and the therapist. There is no better opportunity for you to train your therapist by helping them understand the surgical procedures you've performed and really allow them to get motion started and do functional assessments that can help their patients return to their activities of daily living and their work. And so I think the communication and the collaboration is essential to a great outcome and great outcomes are, great, are fantastic for all of us, therapists and surgeons together. Great, thank you for that. Do we have any other questions from the audience? We're just about to close and we wanna make sure we give everybody a chance to ask any questions they have at the end of the presentation. There's, a, there's no questions from the audience, but if I may pose a question to Gary and Becky, uh, how often in a scaphoid non-union operative treatment do you feel the need 
to use a static progressive device to improve range of motion? And do you think that's really critical at all, especially for resource poor environments uh, where some of our audience may be from? My first answer is you, not very often. Um, most of the time through normal rehab and activities and home program and follow through, we can get where we wanna go. Um, you know, I always stress with, with risk, especially a little bit stability over mobility. And most people don't need to do it, don't quite need the mobility that they think they need. They need pain-free motion and good stability and, and be able to return to their activities. So I'm not gonna fight for five more degrees and, and go crazy over things. I want them to be strong. I want them to be stable. I want them to be able to do things and, and think of the wrist a little bit more of a stabilizer than worrying about doing handstands and yoga poses sometimes. I think the only thing I would add to that is one of my favorite tests that I don't think people recognize as being as helpful as it is, is the modified weeks test. And so basically you can really take your patient through the phases of kind of going from cold and taking range of motion, heating them up, doing a low load, long stretch and understanding based on the change in motion, how much you can accomplish. That test, the modified weeks test helps you understand what orthosis to use and whether it may or may not be effective. And so I think that's just a huge opportunity rather than slapping on a splint and thinking if I just crank on this for a while, it's gonna help using data to support your choices is essential. And with that said, also, your, your choice is really only extension because you're not going to splint them into flexion because you start having median nerve compromise the second you start getting for the long hold, you know, past 20 or 30 degrees. So it's really trying to get, I, I agree with what Becky said, but really it's the direction you're looking for it is wrist extension and trying to meet the patient's needs if you're doing splinting for that. Right. Thank you both for that. And uh, thanks to all the faculty. That was a great discussion. I think we all learned from each other and hopefully everyone in the audience did so as well. Again, stay tuned for CME, which will be coming to you to fill out your CME credit claiming. And there uh, is another session coming up a week from today. It's our final session in the series and we hope to see you all there again. Thank you very much for participating tonight and have a good evening.